So the book of Amos, chapter 1, starting in verse 3, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sludges of iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Hazel and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon and him who holds the scepter of Beth Eden. And the people of Syria shall go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them to Edom. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza and I shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod and him who holds the scepter from Ascalon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnants of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre and it shall devour her strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman and it shall devour the strongholds of Borzra. Bor, uh, Basra, there we go. Uh, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions, the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, and their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire upon Moab and shall devour the strongholds of Keroth and Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst and I will kill all its princes with him, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that your word is real and it speaks of real things, that it is not cotton candy, positive, encouraging, K-love, God, but it is the Bible. It's the whole truth, God. It's your revelation uh, against all wickedness, God, that you're a God that lays it out for us. So, Lord, we pray as we come to this hard passage of Scripture that we would come to it with soft hearts, ready to repent, and we thank you for the grace that we have in your Son. Amen. Well, there's a lot going on in a rather long passage today, so we're going to look at it in broad strokes, starting with how Amos structures the judgment of God against Israel. So in verses 1, our our passage today, Amos lists off uh, judgments against six pagan nations that border Israel. And then... Uh, in next week, we'll look at uh, how he briefly deals with Israel's closest neighbor in geography and roots, Judah, before finally getting to Israel herself. Uh, it's really a pretty ingenious way of building tension. Uh, God, as we saw last week in verse 2, is like a lion. Here he is like a predator slowly zeroing in on his prey. He's circling Israel, dealing with each of her neighbor's transgressions, getting closer and closer to Israel as he speaks. As an aside, uh, when you see God deal with another person's sin, one good and safe practice is to ask yourself if you're guilty of that same sin. If you dealt with that sin uh, in that person, he'll surely in his time deal with it in you, right? So anytime as a pastor, I see a pastor fall from ministry, I immediately think, like, how? And is that in my life? I don't think, I'm glad I'm not that guy. I mean, I am, but I want to stay not that guy. Right? And so when you see other people uh, get judged and fall into sin, uh, what you should do is look in your own heart. Say, is that there? You actually see this idea contained in Galatians 6.1. Uh, Paul writes, brother, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Here surrounding Israel are six pagan nations under judgment. They should be a catalyst for Israel to take her own spiritual inventory, to keep watch on her own soul. 
Now, in each case, God says, for three transgressions and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Then he details aspects of this fourth transgression. Now, I mentioned last week that the purpose of the for three and for four formula is to stress the patience and forbearance of God. God doesn't immediately bring judgment on people or nations when they commit sins. Praise the Lord. We'd all be gone, right? He allows them time to see the error of their way and to repent. Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God is slow to anger. This is part of his character. He's a patient God. Now, Paul, however, warns the Jews about presuming upon the patience of God in Romans 2, verses 4 through 5. He says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God's kindness in not bringing immediate judgment on you should not comfort you in your sin, but rather lead you to repentance. One of the big questions of the Old Testament is why do the wicked, or why do the wicked prosper? And wicked people do prosper for a time, right? But their day ends. And maybe they prosper for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. But what is 50 years in the light of eternity? How fast do decades just start to fly by? The wicked only prosper for a moment, and then judgment comes quick. So if you don't take advantage of God's uh, kindness and repent, all you're doing is storing up wrath on that day. Israel was storing up wrath for a day of judgment, and it did eventually come. Israel, the northern tribe, the, the, the tr 10 tribes up north, that kingdom, judgment came. They were brought into exile, and those tribes had been mixed and disappeared, right? We don't really know what happened to them. They just got dispersed. It was God's judgment. Now, a transgression is the breaking of a code or a law. So over and over again, he talks about these transgressions. That begs the question, what law did the pagan nations transgress? What law were they breaking? Again, Paul answers this question in Romans 2, verses 14 through 16. So Gentiles is a word that just refers to any non-Jew. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So everyone has a knowledge. They have a conscience. Just simply means with knowledge, right? We're born with this. We have a sense of, of right and wrong. Little kids, when they do wrong, hide, right? They have natural shame. Uh, there is, of course, nature and nurture. There is a nurturing people into things, but there's a nature that's very evident to anyone. And uh, Moiter, he explains, or excuse me, Moiter, he explains, uh, they were without special revelation, but not without moral responsibility. They were without direct knowledge of God, but not without accountability to God. They were without the law written upon the tables of stone, but not without the law written in their conscience. Everyone has a natural awareness of the law of God, especially in how it relates to others. We feel guilt when we steal from others. We feel guilt when we hurt others unjustly. We feel guilt when we disrespect and lie about others. That's the conscience. A lot of times non-Christians will say, oh, you think uh, just because we're non-Christians that we don't have morality? I say, no, I know you do, and that's the problem. Right? That's the problem. You will be held accountable before God. Right? The law of God is just all the more clear, Right? It's, it's a written revelation of God. But yes, everyone has a knowledge of right and wrong. Not as perfect as, it is, as when corrected and taught by Scripture, but they have it. Now, a conscience can be seared and hardened to the point you no longer feel guilt for wrongdoing. That is a dangerous place to be in. I'd argue that the conscience of our nation is dangerously hardened. 
right? It is a hard in place. We lack shame. It is incredible. I remember, um, so in a former life, I played cards for a living, okay? Long story, uh, some other time. But uh, anyhow, I remember someone telling me about how evil Vegas was. And Vegas is an evil place. But I remember pointing out to them that at that time, if you went to a mall, our own Eastgate Mall, this is back when people still went there. Now there's just like tumbleweeds blowing through and you know, like it's, it's a spooky place actually. You never know. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I remember going there and, and, and seeing the mannequins and they had put certain features on mannequins that I was like, why? It was very like weird, scantily clad stuff in the windows. All the advertisements were so sexually explicit right there in Eastgate Mall, where you walk with your family, where you walk with your little kids. And what I was trying to explain to people, I wasn't really trying to justify Vegas. I suppose maybe I was. But what I was saying is the whole country, it has become Vegas, right? The whole country is full of gambling, of cheating. Uh, it, you know, nowadays, social media, it's just hard to believe the stuff that's on social media or on television. You know, Disney has, uh, has a new show out that's got a mature rating. Because I don't know. No one, I don't know anyone that watches Disney stuff almost at all anymore. But um, it, our nation has just grown uh, at ease with crassness and all sorts of just depraved stuff. We've gotten used to it. It's hard not to get used to it, right? When you see it every day. Now, these pagan nations lacked shame right? Shame is like pain. So if you step on a nail, your nerves say, ouch, don't do that. That's a good thing, right? Now, shame is where you feel pain for doing wrong. Now, it's not good to feel shame for something like if you're ashamed of being a woman or ashamed of being a man or ashamed of being a Christian, that's a bad thing. You don't want to feel shame for good things. That means something's not right. Like if you move your arm in a normal way and it hurts, that's not your nerves working right. Something's wrong, okay? Uh, so it's shame. there's good shame and bad shame. And now we don't feel good shame anymore. And that's leading us further and further into depravity. Now, uh, Amos organizes his uh, judgments around these nations in a series of an increasingly intense relational couplets. Because these people may not have the law of God, but they know how you're to treat others because people want to be treated uh, a certain way themselves. So again, Moiter again says, the spotlight falls not on what they may or may have not done or held in relation to God, but on what they have done man to man, specifically the barbarity of all the stuff in this. Now the first couplet is Damascus in Gaza in verses three through eight. And they're brought under judgment for a sort of general cruelty. Uh, Damascus, it says, threshed Gilead with the threshing sledges of iron, or as the KJV puts it, instruments of iron. So many commentators think this is probably a reference to torture, people being killed using saws and all sorts of things. And uh, it, so it's one thing to kill an enemy in combat. It is another thing to torture that enemy. This is a terrible sin. It is a terrible thing to torture people. Uh, death is an enemy, and it's wrong for us to revel in death, right? Death happens, but we don't want, that's, this is the problem with these horror movies and gore and all this stuff. When you watch that, it has a ability to, um, uh, to kind of numb you. I think it's David Grossman. He is a colonel that writes one of his big fears of modern video games is that people are becoming uh, at ease with killing people, right? First, like first person shooters. And why it, he said it actually made soldiers worse soldiers because in the line of duty, they weren't able to operate with proper discernment on when to pull the trigger and when not to pull the trigger. There is a time in war to pull the trigger, sadly. That is the nature of the way. We're not pacifists. Scripture is not, uh, doesn't teach pacifism. Uh, but, uh, but there's a sort of barbarity that uh, we are comfortable with that they are actively engaging. Now we're mostly consumers of it. But if you continue to consume something, it's not long before you start to participate in it. So be warned. Now Gaza 
sold their ent- like entire families and villages into brutal slavery. So they just picked up these whole people as opposed to just taking the men or taking the youth. It was like everyone. And in doing so, they extinguished entire family lines. Like their lands were lost forever. Their name was like erased forever. So this is again a, a form of cruelty. Like it's, a, it's especially wicked. Uh, so these nations are guilty of a sort of general barbarity, right? They lack compassion. They reveled in cruelty. Uh, and for this, the Lord burned their lands and he ends up sending them into slavery as well. Now, the second couplet is Tyre and Edom in verses 9 through 12. They're brought under judgment for cruelty as well, but it's of a more intense sort because it's towards their own brothers. It's natural to have special care for your family and your own people. Everyone should care for, like, what do you call a man who takes care of his neighbor's kids but neglects his own kids? Is he a good guy? Right? Does it, does it even out? Like, that's a set of kids. That's a set of kids. Right? That's a positive. That's a negative. Added together and we're back at zero. Right? No, he's neglecting his family. And he is to have a care for them because they're, they're near and dear. They're, the saying goes, right, that blood is thicker than, than water. So it's very natural to care uh, for your family. I love the phrase in verse 9, the covenant of brotherhood. That just sounds cool. I like it. It's like a book title, but who has time to write books? Uh, you can have a close brotherhood with people who aren't your own blood, right? We, the church... Know this to be the case. I would actually argue that the waters of baptism are thicker than blood. Because when we come to that in faith, when we're believers, our brotherhood will last forever, which is not guaranteed by blood relation alone. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The relationships that we can have with people that aren't family is amazing. I've always been blown away by how God brings such a diverse group of people together in congregations and how close of friends we become. And we wouldn't usually choose each other as friends under other circumstances. Now, Edom uh, was the blood of Israel because they descended from Jacob's brother Esau. Um, And this covenant of brotherhood specifically references the treaty made between Solomon and Hiram, the king of Tyre, in uh, 1 Kings uh, 5.12, uh, they broke that treaty and trampled on the old friendships just for momentary gain. So they did not, you know, uh, they, they did not keep that, that nearness, that closeness. They, I think about some preachers. There's one guy that got, he was really famous for a long time. And uh, his, he ended up falling in ministry mostly just for kind of be author, authoritarian. But I I've generally choose not to go after him publicly just because I owe him so much in how he discipled me, right? I'm a, I've benefited from his ministry, and there's a sort of, like, uh, debt I have there, right? It doesn't mean I wouldn't say something if I needed to, but there's a debt of friendship here, right? A bond of friendship that's broken, that's not good, that's unnatural, and therefore God judges them for it. I like what Matthew Henry says in uh, relations to Edom. Their particular sin was a unmerciful, unwearied pursuit of the people of God, and they're taking all advantage against them to do them uh, mischief. He did pursue his brother with the sword, not only of old, when the king of Edom took up arms to oppose the children of Israel's passage through his border, in the uh, Exodus, but ever since upon all occasions, they had not strength and courage enough to face them in the field of battle. But whenever any other enemy had put Judah or Israel to flight, then the Edomites set in with their pursuers, fell upon the rear, slew those that were half dead already, and as is usual with cowards, when they have an enemy at an advantage, they did cast off all pity. Those that are, uh, are the least courageous are commonly most cruel. Isn't that true? Cowards are cruel people when they get power. They're very cruel. Maybe that'll help you understand Revelation 21.8, right? It says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, 
the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So God has a special, he, he judges people for being cowards. It's a sin to be a coward. God will judge these nations who killed their brothers and disregarded friendships. The third and final couplet is the Ammonites and Moab in verses 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 113 all the way to 2-3. Their cruelty was focused on those who could not defend themselves, the helpless. So it's kind of gainy. It's going from a general cruelty to the breaking of friendship and brothers. And now it's, uh, it's a cruelty towards those that couldn't ever defend themselves. It's getting more and more intense. The Ammonites uh, brutalized pregnant women. Uh, the creation of life is a sacred and special thing. Uh, only the cruelest nations, only uh, the individuals with the most seared and hardened conscience would purposely injure a pregnant woman and harm a child. Uh, for many years, Emily and I would, were involved in uh, kind of like sidewalk ministry at abortion clinics. And I was down almost every Saturday for many years at the Greenville Women's Clinic down in South Carolina. And uh, every time that abortion doctor would come in, he would have to drive past us. And I'd stand like right on the road, so his window would be like here. And every time he passed me, he smiled, right? And behind that building, in a, in a dumpster, were the parts of babies. Now, I don't enjoy talking about these sort of things on Sunday. But these things are in scripture to remind us to not look the other way. One of the purposes, when you go down to an abortion clinic, you're not going to stop people from having abortions very often. I know, I've been down there for a long time, but you are a public witness that a crime, an evil is being committed here. We do not, we wanna to continue to have that public witness because there are evil people. I don't see we, as in America, avoid judgment for the cruelty of abortion. It's terrible. May God have mercy on us. So just as the Ammonites desecrated the beginning of life, Moab desecrates the end of the life. Verse 2-1 says, God is judging Moab because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. I want to zoom in on this because... I was forced to think about cremation versus burial when my daughter died about, about 11 years ago now, or 12, something like that. And my research led me to this very verse in Amos 2.1. And it's not a topic that's dealt with often. Um, and one of the reasons we go through scripture, book by book, passage by passage, is to deal with things uh, as, as God has put them in scripture. So it's here. You almost never hear sermons dealing with this, so I, I want to give a little extra time to it today. Uh, but I, I want to tell you uh, that when someone dies, you don't get to see their body. It prevents a good deal of closure. If you've been through death, you know what I'm talking about. And when you see a spiritless body, uh, you know that there is more to life than the physical. I, when I prepared my children for the death of their grandmother, or after the death, when they're going to see her body, it's, I said, it's not going to look human because there's part of her that is gone that's not there, right? Uh, so I want us to consider cremation versus burial for a moment. Also, I know this will be a sensitive subject because some of you have cremated your loved ones. And I want you to know that my mother and I were forced by circumstance to have my younger brother, uh, Wayne, cremated. It's not ideal. I wasn't happy about it. Uh, so I am one of you, if that's the situation you find yourself in. Uh, and I do want to say, though, given ability and opportunity, I think you should always choose burial. And let me explain why. First, here's what Calvin says in his commentary on this, this verse here. To dig up the bodies of enemies <clears throat> and to burn their bones, this is an inhuman deed and wholly barbarous. But it was more detestable in the Moabites, who had some connection with the people of Edom. For they descended from the same family, and the memory of that relationship ought to have continued since Abraham brought up Lot and the father of the Moabites, and thus the Moabites were under obligation to the Edomites. If then any humanity exists in them, they ought to have restrained their passions so as not to treat so cruelly their brethren. Now, 
when they exceeded all moderation and war and raged against dead bodies and burnt the bones of the dead, it was, as I have said, an extremely barbarous conduct. The meaning then is that the Moabites could no longer be born with, for in this one instance, they gave an example of savage cruelty. Had there been a drop of humanity in them, they would have treated more kindly their brethren, the Edomites, but they burnt into lime, that is, into ashes, the bones of the king of Edom, and thereby proved that they had forgotten all humanity and justice. We now understand the prophet's meanings. So it's desecrating. We have somehow lost the category of desecration. But it's still in the law books. Uh, here's the Ohio Revised Code on abuse of corpse. No person except an authorized by law shall treat a human corpse in a way that the person knows would outrage reasonable family sensibilities. No person except an authorized uh, by law shall treat a human corpse in a way that would outrage reasonable community sensibilities. I love that it's not just family, but a broader societal uh, morality. See, whoever violates Division A of this section is guilty of the abuse of a corpse, a misdemeanor of the second degree. Whoever violates Division B of this section is guilty of gross abuse of a corpse, a felony of the fifth degree. So this is something that is still on our books and something that actually I, I've seen. Uh, it's not like one of those weird, you can't ride a horse backwards on Tuesday sort of laws. This is a law that people still cite. So let me give you a positive case, though, for burial, as opposed to just leaning in on cremation. First, the positive example of scripture makes it clear that burial was ideal among the saints throughout the ages. Abraham went to great lengths to bury Sarah, Genesis 23. One of Jacob's main concerns is that he be buried not in Egypt, but alongside his fathers. See that in Genesis 47. It's also notable, again, the measures that Joseph takes to honor his vow to bury his father according to his particular request in Genesis 50. Joseph echoes his father's request and has his bones carried out of Egypt for burial. You see this in Joshua 24, 32. So all the patriarchs made burial a priority. This priority runs throughout scripture with the most significant case being the burial of our Lord. Second, there's a command to bury in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23, a passage Paul cites in Galatians. It reads, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day for he who is hanged is accursed of God so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. This passage clearly is using the hanging on a tree as a public deterrent against such terrible crimes, but not to, point, not to the point that it desecrates the body. Calvin again says, moreover, that they may take more careful heed in this matter, he declares that the land would be defiled if the corpse should be left hanging on the cross, such, since such inhumanity pollutes and disgraces the land. When we allow things like that to happen, it leads to a corruption of our society. We become comfortable with, with these terrible things. Now, third, uh, it seems clear to me that the lack of a burial in Scripture is connected to extreme judgment. For example, there was a warning the prophet gave to Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13. O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Now this prophecy is fulfilled in 2 Kings 23, 20. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars, and burned men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. Note that the burning of bones were part of God's judgment. Uh, we see something similar in God's extreme judgment of Jezebel in 2 Kings 9.10. The dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of uh, Jezreel, and none shall bury her. The same idea is often applied in war, where God's judgment is being carried out by God's people against the pagan nation. You can see this in God's judgment on the Philistines under the lead of David. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I'll strike you down and remove your head from you and I'll give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. It is a judgment to have a body desecrated and spread amongst the earth. Now, again, uh, sometimes it, 
burying people is expensive. It is expensive. It was almost 10 grand to have the most simple casket we could find, non-wooden casket, uh, and to bury my mother right here. It's a lot of money. And I know some of you are not always in a situation where you can do that. But one reason burial is so beautiful is that just as standing out in front of a, a uh, abortion clinic is a testimony of terrible things being done, buried corpses are a testimony of the resurrection to come. It is a way of confessing your faith in death that the dead shall rise again. I just got my mom's uh, headstone, it took a while, and Don Esther Foster, until the resurrection. Until the resurrection, and again she'll rise. Right? So it is one way, one of many ways, to confess your faith. If the Lord should give you the means and opportunity, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Now, after listing these six pagan nations guilty of 24 transgressions, he finally gets to the people of God, starting with Judah in verse 4 of chapter 2, and Israel in verse 6. We'll look at that in more detail next week, but let me close with this. Paul builds his argument in Romans 1 and 2 in a way that directly mirrors Amos 1 and 2. In Romans 1, Paul lists all the evils among the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews. He says they do all these terrible things. And then Amos does the exact same thing with these six nations. Now this might make uh, Judah and Israel feel righteous because as, at least we aren't as bad as these cruel nations, right? We haven't burned bones or done any of these things. But both Amos and Paul, being good covenantal prosecutors, were building a case against God's people. In Romans 2, Paul, after listing all the evils of these pagans, says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So chapter 2, he turns to the Jews. You've got the law. You think you're better than these people? You think you're that different, are you? It goes on, verse 17 of Romans 2. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge of truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say the one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. It's a good warning, church, for us as well. We have more than our conscience. We have the word of God, 66 books. Not only do we have that, we have the Holy Spirit that leads us into truth, that makes sure that our conscience does not stay seared, right? He is faithful to convict us of our sins. As we look at the cruelty and sinfulness of our time, which must be called out, we must prophesy against it in the sense that we say that is bad. We may feel the temptation to be self-righteous, to think I'm not like them. Thank the Lord that I'm not like Edom. But it is wiser to use it as an opportunity to practice repentance, to take a little self-inventory, to say, Lord, I don't want to be like them. Is there any evil way in me? Search it out. And then pursue holiness. Right? It is good to call out judgment and wickedness. But let's do it without hypocrisy. May God, by grace, uh, purify us and make us like his son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, how powerful it is, how shocking it is, Lord. Oh, I pray that we would meditate on it, we'd soak in it, and we wouldn't let uh, cultural sensibilities uh, to neuter it, to take away its power, God. 
Lord, we pray we would be holy people. Lord, we pray you'd have mercy in our, our country, our nation, that we could be salt and light here, that our lives, though imperfect, would reflect the light of the world that is Jesus, and that people would want uh, to know you, God. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.